if you are excited to be a follower of Jesus, can you give him a loud shout? Number one, the first of this set of people are the people I call the multitudes or the spectator. In Mark chapter 4 verse 25, the Bible told us about the multitudes, Mark 4 25, the multitude and the spectators that followed him. For whoever asked to him, no, Mark chapter 4 is that, Matthew, sorry, sorry, it's Matthew chapter 4 verse 25. Sorry, media, Matthew chapter 4 verse 25. Are you there? Matthew 4, 25. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and beyond the city. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, the same thing was said about the multitudes that followed him. They were the first group of people I want to talk about. And when he has come down from the mountain, great multitudes follow him. You can call them follow, follow. They were the spectators. These were the largest number. These people are anything goes. They are no friends, and yet they are no foes. They are there to look at what is happening. They were a mixture of opposers and supporters. The Bible called them in the Old Testament mixed multitude. You will find so many examples of where these people showed themselves in the scriptures. These people were so many, they followed Jesus in Luke chapter 19. They clapped for him when he entered Jerusalem, the first Palm Sunday. And they rejoiced, they called him Hosanna. But the same group of people in Luke chapter 22, when Jesus was arrested, still shouted, crucify him, crucify him. The multitude, the crowd, the largest number. I want to ask you a question. Is this the group you belong to? These are the groups of Christians by name. These are the groups of bench warmers in church. These are the group of the silent majority. They are always in the largest number, but they are very silent. I ask you a question. Is this your category of the people following Jesus? Are you part of the silent majority? Are you part of the crowd? The second group of people that followed Jesus when he was here are the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sahendrins. These people, meticulously, everywhere Jesus goes, if they are not there, they will send somebody to represent them. <laughs> These are the critics. They were there to study him, to find out what he will say wrong. They are the Opposers, they were the fault finders. They were always looking for what he didn't do right. Today, you find them on social media. There are many Christians like that. They are the first to speak against pastors on social media. They are the first to attack the church on social media. They are the first. In fact, when anything happens in their church, they are the first that will tell people outside. This is what happened in our church. The critics. Alas, such people are still many in the church today. Apart from the first category, which are the multitudes, I discovered these are also the second largest as we have. 
The social media I said is full of many of people like this, as I told you. We still have them in the church. We have them around us. They are the ones that are in the church, but they complain. They complain about the choir, yet they cannot sing. They talk about the light, and yet they are not paying a cobble to support the church. They criticize everybody and everything. And at the end of the day, that contribution is zero or very little. They will always find a reason why something is not right. They are very good in critical analysis. And they are very good at pulling things down. These are, these are people that they follow haters of God on social media. Now, I, I, I have to say this. I wonder where many of these people, some of these people, when you look at the people that follow them, it will shock you you find Christians. What is a child of God doing following an unbeliever on social media? It's not that the person is a, is a business mentor. The person is not uh, a political mentor. It's not that there's anything gay. It's just a social influencer. And they are influencing you. And then you follow haters of God and haters of the church. And people that say nothing good about the church of God. They are the people that you follow on social media. I was asked a question on national TV some years ago. About the proliferation of churches. And I knew the angle they were bringing forth. But I can't tie it. I said, I know. I know there are churches everywhere. Sometimes you, but you see, that does not reduce the impact of the church. I told them, I said, listen to this. If the church in Nigeria especially, I can speak for the church in Nigeria. That's my constitution. If the church in Nigeria have not done what we have done over the years, it will have been worse than this. You will have more drug addicts. You will have more, more bastard children. The church have done a lot. Put your hands together for the church. Nigeria will have been worse. A nation that have no social welfare. You don't know what church is doing. During the COVID-19, I knew how many times we did palliative. My government did not give me one naira. I can say it. This is public news. My governor may hear this himself. But that's the truth. I didn't collect one naira from any government. And we did palliative for people in our area. An average church pays school fees. Average pastor pays children's school fees. Pay house rent. The church is where people run to where you are in need. Where is the government? The church has become the only thing that does social and, 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 and welfare in this country. The work of the government. And then they open their mouth and say the church is useless. God fired their father, the bastard, the devil. We cannot look because of one or two bad things, then criticize everything the church is doing. The church of God in Nigeria is still a strong church. The body of Christ in Nigeria, God is still with us. Yes, we have some bad eggs. We have them everywhere. We have some nonsense things going on. Yes, but the body of Christ is still the church that is doing well. Put your hands together for the church in Nigeria. If not for the church, I don't know where this country will have been. If not for the messages people are hearing. But when you come to church and social media, I don't know. How, do you know that recently mental health has become a major problem? Uh, the church is what has helped Nigeria. The church has helped Nigeria. The average Nigerian, because you go to church, you hear messages that encourage you. So you are not, you are not open to mental illness. Mental illness is everywhere. It may be that day you go to church, your pastor will say something. You say, the Holy Spirit has encouraged me. If those things are not there, what is just it? In this world, when you wake up in this country, when you wake up in the morning, and by the time you wake up, fuel have jumped, and salary have not increased. In the last few months, everything has gone up. How many of you have had salary increase in the last one year? One year. Raise your hand. You have had salary increase in the last one year. Raise your hand. No. How many of you, cost of things have increased in the last one year? Raise your hand. So how are we coping? How are we coping? So don't join those who bowed mount the church. 
and pull down everything the church is doing. And please, I beg you, don't join them on social media to pull down the church. Let God do his work of sanctification by himself. Don't let's start washing our dirty lining in the public. It's our father's house. And when anything happens, let's learn to keep our hand thing inside. How many times have you seen some members of the opposite position, the religion, going on social media and, and talking nonsense? Someone, one, are you covering the evil? No. Are we saying we should accept all the nonsense going? No. But there's always a better way to present it that you not insult my father. And the church of God. If you understand me, say, I hear you. So I ask you a question. Is that the second group of people you belong to? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. The modern day Sahendrians. Number three. The third group of people that surrounded Jesus when he was alive. And these are also in the largest number. They are the one I call the needy and the miracle seekers. The needy and the miracles, their number is many. After the multitudes, then you have the needy and the miracle seekers. And then you have the, the critics. Talking about the needy and the miracle seekers, it's not that God is against miracles or needs. In fact, I check my Bible, I discover that the Bible is a book of miracles. If you agree with me, say, yes, I agree. It's a book of miracles from Genesis to Revelation. There is no Christianity without miracles. One of the things God wants to do in our lives, I shared with you yesterday about reward. He wants to do things in our lives. He wants to meet our need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. By who? By Christ Jesus. So, it is not wrong to come to the Lord because you need things. It is not wrong for you to seek the face of the Lord because you want him to intervene. That is why we serve him. I have experienced miracles in my life. Let me share some with you to encourage you. I can stand here for the next one hour and I'm not, I am not exaggerating. I can tell you stories upon stories in my personal life, in my ministry of what is clearly God's hand and God coming in to intervene. I remember many, many years ago, I told you a story yesterday about my daughter. Many, many years ago, I was coming to Lagos from Ibadan. I was coming for the convention of a son of mine. He's now in Canada, having a ministry in Canada. And I was coming for a convention. And I was, then I was using Benz 200. You know those days of Benz 200. And the car broke down on Lagos Express Road. And I don't know what happened. So I have to park the car on the express road. And I have to pick. My wife was with me. We are going together. I was the one driving. So, we, and the time was going. It was getting to the evening of the meeting. So, I parked the car. And we went by the express road. And we waved down a car that was going. And a man dropped, stopped. He was the only one in the car. And as he was going, the man said, uh, he will introduce herself. He said, it's not a commercial. I just want to help you when he saw the two of you. I said, thank you so much. Then he said, that, well, he works at so-so-so place. He has been plighting this road for the past three years. You know, he never had accidents. As if God knows what we have. As he was talking about that, he's a very careful driver. That's how he goes simply, simply on his way. He just goes on his way. <laughs> As he was saying that, the Lord spoke to me, said, carry on. Because our traveling bag was in the boot, but there's a small luggage I carried. He said, carry the small luggage, put it on your lap, and put it in front of you. I had him clearly. So I carried the luggage, I put it here. As I was putting it here, the next thing I said, Gah! We had an accident. And the car went inside. Every time I passed that road, I still remember that place. And the car saw my sort of baga, baga. And we went inside the bush in a swamp. And the car turned upside down. The tire was up and it was rolling. For about a few minutes, everything was black. Nobody talked. Three of us. The next thing I remember is my wife. I called for her. She answered. I called the driver. She answered. I was the only one that was able to get out. If not for the bag I put here, you will be, I would not be alive today. So I came out from the glass, the windscreen, 
As I was trying to come out, I saw people coming. I saw a man on the road shouting. Accident has happened. I saw them flying in the road. I saw them. He was looking from afar. So he rushed to us. We came out of the car. That accident, not only was that the miracle that God did, I was in usage because of that incident. And then they diagnosed that I have upper thoracic spine injury, C-spine injury. I cannot forget the lead just old language. And I was lying down in West West 2. If you know you see that's the spinal cord injury ward. And I was lying down, my leg was stretched and my head was stretched, and they put something there. And they told my pastors to cancel all my meetings that I may not live here for the next one year. But I surprised the Lord surprised them. While I was there, within three or four days, the Lord was speaking to me about the next program we are going to have. <laughs> I said, I'm my God was giving me instruction. This is the next thing. This is what people should do. So I was basing on that. They said, don't stand up. I didn't stand up. But one night, pardon my stubbornness. After they have removed all the jackets, I was still lying here. I stood up. The nurses were not there in the world, but I stood up. As I stood, my eyes was doing like this. So I, I stood by the bed, then I stood up. I touched the plant for the first time like a baby. My feet cannot even stand. And I did like this and I stood. Okay, I said, so I can stand now. I tried the second day. On the third day when I stood up, I went around the ward praying for the sick. It was there I saw a man who had been in the ward for 14 years. Wow. Yeah. And I was praying for the sick. I have seen miracles. I'm not talking of the one in others. I'm talking of my own life. I've had another accident. It was, it was Ibadan, Abekuta, I mean, Jabude. That time I said, okay, I'm not going to pass through this one. Let me pass through, because I was going to Ekpe. So let me pass through Jabude. A son of mine was driving. I sat in the front. Just a few minutes to the incident. The Lord said, lower the chair. So I lowered the chair, and I decided to go like this, to rest. The next thing, bah! I opened my eyes. There was a thick wood that passed in front of me like this. It will have placed my enemy's neck. I don't know the stranger that picked us. It was the same usage they took us to. But I survived it. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I can turn there and tell you that God will serve. He's a miracle working God. I have made up my mind to serve him till I die. When we got married, we got married in days of SU. That your mommy Gio knows the day I'm talking about. Those are the times when people, people you know, the, those are the SU days. You, when you get married, you get married properly, not the way you do it today. Then the children were not coming. And the weeks were becoming months. The months were becoming years. And the children were not coming. And the Lord gave me a promise that He's going to give you. And one day I saw a revelation. I saw a son. I saw a boy and a girl. And I saw the girl was older than the, the boy was older than the girl. And they were sitting at the back of the car and I was driving. And that was where there was no hope at all. Today, that vision is a reality. I went to do a crusade in Benin Republic some years ago in a place called Afranco. And in the evening, many people came for that meeting. The first day was mighty. God proved himself. And so the testimony of what God have done went round to the town. And while the second day was going on, another miracle took place. The biggest of the miracle in that crusade. Three days crusade. That was a crusade we have to interpret by two people. I was speaking English. Somebody was speaking French. Another person was speaking another language, the local language. Now you can see how stressful that kind of ministration is. And while the meeting was going on, I saw people shouting from the back. And they were making way. And this tiny looking girl was coming forward to the front. And as she got to the altar, the mother screamed from the back, that's my daughter, that's my daughter. This is the story. This girl had been given up to die. Put in a room. Slop there. They have tried all kinds of things. They like juju in that place, if you know been in the Republic. They have done all kinds of nothing. Nothing was happening, walking. They have given up to die. They came to the crusade, they didn't even bring their girl. They came, they did not bring their daughter. Because they thought there is no hope for her. 
When they got home the first night, they were talking and just about what God did. And the girl had in one kubiku they put her. So when they were going the second day, they called the junior sister and said, please take me to that meeting. That one said, I won't take you. You are a disgrace. I don't want people to see me with you. So he promised her that I will give you my food for the next three days. That one said, that's a big deal. That's a good deal. So he said, but I cannot carry you now. I will go to the crusade. When it's around seven, you know that kind of time in crusade. I will come and carry. So she left and came in the evening and carried her at her back. A girl that was almost 10 years junior to her carried her at the back and brought her to the crusade gun, dumped her by the, by the, by the base of a tree, left her so that nobody would see her. God left all the big people in front and met that girl at the back. We serve a miracle working God. I had a crusade in Kishi some years ago. And I have one of the strangest experiences of the power of God. I'm talking of my experience. I can tell you of others. I'm talking of what I have seen. And a woman was healed that day of insanity. Now, this is a strange insanity. It's a peculiar kind of madness. This woman had a second wife. The husband had a second wife. And then the second wife got jealous of her and took her hair, according to the story, after the testimony. And took her hair to one particular village. I won't tell you the place because some of you are from that place. And they do some concussion, whatever. And she gone mad. Now this is special madness. And she was this mad for 30 years. Did you hear me? What is the kind of madness? During the day, she's normal. But in the night, she goes mad. They tried all kinds of things, took her everywhere, brought her to Lagos. And after some time, the children felt they have tried enough. And the children are doing well. They went and dumped their mother back in the village. After some time, they've done everything. You know what they now did? They now prepared a special mad house for her. Because she would go mad every evening. So they built a small house. When it is 6 o'clock, she will enter the house, the small cubicle. It has lock outside. There is no lock inside. So she will enter. She will greet them. Good night to her. I'm going to be mad. I'm going inside to go and mad. Because they don't want her to roam about. So she will enter. She will be mad inside that place. Shout, scream. When it is morning, the madness will go. She will knock the door again. Come and open the door. I am no more mad. So she will take a bad walk. When it is around six, she will go back. And she was doing that for many years. And one night, the madness disappear forever. For many years, the pastor, that pastor at one of the Baptist churches, was in touch with me for many years. I have seen that God will serve. He's a miracle working God. He that can do what you want. That's why I want to encourage you. Don't serve another God. This God is more than enough. If you believe it, can I hear a shout of amen? amen. Let me share this lastly. Our ministry has seven hams. One of our hams is missions. I know the Jew is a mission man. Sir, I want to celebrate you. I knew what you did in worry and environment. I knew the... Come on, put your hands together for this great general. I knew how that place was when God sent you. And I knew what you did in the years you were there. Great work. Your work was a motivation for me. It was an encouragement for me. Our ministry have missions. We work among the Barubas and the Gandofulanis. Those of you from Kwara State here, we know where we call Baruba land. How many of you are from Kwara State? You know Baruba land? Good. That's the largest local government area in Nigeria, in landmass. The Barubas are still calculated today as an unrich people group. So that's where we base, basically. And the Barubas cover from Nigeria to Benin Republic. So I went there. We have churches there now. We went there before Four Square. Four Square is now there. So we see near you in that area. We went there before winners. We were there before redeem. Clap for us. We were there. We were actually the first Pentecostal church that got to that land. And we are doing our work in our own little way. In those days, I used to go there regularly. I go there only once or twice a year now. Sometimes I couldn't even go. But I tried to go. I go at least every once. Once a year. I was there at the headquarters mission church. And we had a crusade. And one girl came. Beautiful looking girl, but very skinny. You know, ma you know poverty can make you ugly. Ah, when somebody gets money, she will be fine. There's no war war girl anywhere. 
will what disappear where there's money and brother please what god has given you is beautiful enough take care of her Pane beat her she's as good as anybody outside women have the ability to be renewed when you treat them well take care of your wife treat her well buy clothes for her make her be happy you will see that your wife is beautiful clap if you want to clap people of god i want to because i'm talking about seven group of people and i talk about miracle seekers i don't want you to misunderstand me that i'm against miracle i'm an evangelist i'm only doing this because this is a teaching ministry so i'm not called to come and do crusade here and the bible i mean I, I said the Bible. I'm used to saying the Bible said. So we got to that meeting, and this girl came with a small boy, baby. I don't know whether it's a girl or boy now, for, forgotten. Looking tattered like her. One leg was paralyzed, small girl. Not, I'm talking of a man of a, a woman of 60, 70. That by any stroke in it. The whole place was paralyzed, the one leg, everything, one side, gone. And the sister brought her. And that night, God healed her. Now, let me tell you a story. As God is going to heal people tonight. Yeah. But let me tell you a story. This girl, as a young girl, play as other girls used to play. And she got pregnant. And the boy that pregnant, impregnated her denied the pregnancy. Making two problems. And not only that, there were demonic attacks against her. She said from the day she got pregnant, some women used to appear to her. They would just appear to her and be looking at her. She did everything. They took her from uh, white garment to diabolis to all kinds of places. Ah, what will happen that will make people take you to where you don't want? It will never happen to you. And yet she just kept seeing these women. Every time she saw these women, as many of you have been having some strange visitations, tonight it is ending in the name of Jesus. I met a man sometimes ago in the UK. He came for a meeting, and I was privileged to minister in that meeting. And I said something like this, so he came to meet me. And he said, sir, when I was in Nigeria, which is tormented my life, they gave me problem. Those of you that think there are no riches, there are no witches, there are witches. But the power of God in you is greater than them. He said, they tormented me, they gave me problems, they gave me issues. I started running from one mountain to the other. He said, for about one and a half years, I was not living at home. I was doing prayer. He said, it is out of those prayer meetings I was going, that God just helped me, and somebody helped me, and I got a visa. He said, I ran. He said, when I landed at Itro, I knelt and said, God, I am free. He said, sir, that same night, after I've taken my bath, I was saying, oh, Jen, enjoy low you boo. They said e e The same women appeared to him. See e carbo. He said he shouted, ah, e to wa me debi, meaning you follow me here. I said they don't take visa. You don't know. They don't take visa. They don't uh, they don't even play flight ticket. All this flight ticket is 1.5 million. It doesn't concern them. All they need to do is just do like this. <laughs> Flight don't arrive. Is that you think is that's how you run away from them? You deal with them. This guy said this woman used to appear, but in that meeting, God delivered her. I stand upon the word of God. As many that are gathered here tonight or watching online and you are in need of a miracle, you are trusting Jesus, you are following him, you are praying, you are seeking his face because you want a need to be met. You need a miracle of a baby. You need a miracle of a job. You need a miracle of healing. In the name that is above every other name, I command, receive it now. In the name of Jesus. Receive your miracle. In the name of Jesus. Receive your miracle in the name of Jesus. Receive your miracle in the name of Jesus. Miracle of healing. Miracle of provision. Miracle of deliverance. Miracle of help. In the name of Jesus. What man says cannot be done. Let it become your testimony. In the name of Jesus. 
I command with those hands lifted, let your angel go on assignment and release for you what you need. Now, not tomorrow. Today, not later. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Done. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you believe, put your hands together for Jesus. So we have this third group of people that follow Jesus. The problem about the Indian and the miracle seekers is when you now follow God simply and only because of that, you are in this group. If you are following and that's not your only reason for following, you are not in this group. But there are people today that the reason why they follow God and they come to church is because of that. You see, they see church as hospital. That's what how they see church. And you see, when you go to hospital, you go for healing. Isn't it? And when you are healed, what do you do? Do you stay in the hospital? And so they come, they receive, they go. That's how some people see church. That's how they see prophets or ministers. They see them as doctors. And when you are finished with a doctor, do you go to his house? He goes his way. That's how they relate to God. Some people see church as ATM point. You know those ATM galleries? You have a lot of them in Lagos. You go there to do what? To cash. And after you have cashed, what do you do? You go. So they see the church as a means to make things, to buy, to for let my life be better, let me have money, let things work out. And so after that, they don't have anything to do with the church again. Even if they are inside church, they are not in the church. So it's not wrong to go to the Lord because you need. It is biblical to seek for a miracle. It is right to say, God, you must do this. But you must follow him for reasons bigger than that. If you are with me, say, I hear you, sir. The fourth group of people that follow Jesus are what I call the young converts. The Nicodemus. The people that are just coming to him. That are coming to his knowledge. Thank God that in this group of people, people can move on from this group to an higher level of group. If you check the Bible, the Bible talks about milk drinkers. The Bible talks about meat eaters. The Bible talks about bone crushers. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Let's read some scriptures. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Now, if you are in this group, beautiful, but you must not remain there. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. That's what we are doing in this conference. This is word feast. I want to thank God once again for the first square gospel church. I have said it repeatedly and I meant it. The first square gospel church is the most balanced church. That I've seen. Balanced. I'm an apostle of balance. That's one of the passion God gave to me. I love things being balanced. And to prove that first square believes in balance, look at the logo. It's a square. Yes or no? Now, if you throw a square and roll it on the ground, it is, go is it going to fall? As you keep rolling, what is happening? It will keep standing because it is a square. Thank God for this commission. Put your hands together for Jesus. That's why a church can live three days to say, let's sit down at the word and feast with God's word. That's why I'm trying to control myself, not to turn it to a crusade. Release it as the teaching meeting. You are a baby. You come to the Lord as a baby. But you don't remain a baby. He said, pure meek, sincere meek. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. So we come drinking milk. That's the first thing. I fed you with milk. Paul said it. Not solid food. There are so many people in the church, they are milk drinkers. They don't want solid food. Some of you, when you were young, you give mommy problem. When mommy wanted to start translating to Amala, you didn't want. You still want to be talking. To... <laughs> you gave that woman problem. You didn't want to change. Women, am I talking? The baby does not want to eat to solid food. And when some of you finally turn to solid food, what is the solid food? Indomie. That's the solid food. 
He said, I fed you with meat and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. Even now, you are still unable to receive it. Is that your condition? Baby Christian. When did you go join First Square? 25 years ago. And so what? People joined 10 years ago. They are passed over you. Shame on you. Oh, no duty. When did I become a Christian? I got born again 30 years ago. Uh huh. Hmm. 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 It's not by age, you. I have seen 25 year old boys more mature than 40 year old men. 25. Solid. And let me tell you, in the Christian race, overtaking is allowed. If you don't grow, you keep drinking milk. The hard truth, you don't want it. There are so many Christians today, they only like the funny side of Christianity, the sweet side. When the pastor preach and they jump, they like it. When he start to tell them the hard truth, they don't like that man. Say, I don't like him. I don't like his teaching. I don't like his ministry. Because they don't want to eat the meat now. They just want the milk. They find, find the sweet, sweet, the celebration and jumping and eating and, and just something so soft. But the Bible is complete. The word of God is complete. He said about meat, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 13. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Did you see? You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles. Tell your neighbor, ha, ha, ha. You are still telling you, sister, you didn't come to church. You. Tell your neighbor, say you. They are still begging you to come to church. You. Ah, so we ha. Hmm. You. The first principles of the faith, the basic teachings of the faith, they are still telling you to pay offering. Tell yourself, as yeah, ah, sister, you. The basic principle. Tell him, brother, I don't struggle with well, tight. Ah, ah, you tight. At this level, you are still fighting tight. You. The basic principles of the word of God. And you have not come to need meek and not solid food. I want to encourage you, please, move from being a baby Christian. Start eating solid food. Start crushing bones. That is what God wants you to be. Not somebody that is a baby for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. You are still being fed. There must come a time when, when they are looking... How can they, at the end of this year, the church is looking for leaders. And they are saying, okay, who are the people that will be leaders for next year? And they can't consider you. You are a shame. Move! Be mature! Grow! Love the Lord! Love the world! Serve Him! Be more dedicated! Move from the group of young converts and become a mature Christian. Number five. So we have this third group of people that follow Jesus. The problem about the Indian and the miracle seekers is when you now follow God simply and only because of that, you are in this group. If you are following and that's not your only reason for following, you are not in this group. But there are people today that the reason why they follow God and they come to church is because of that. You see, they see church as hospital. That's what I they see church. And you see, when you go to hospital, you go for healing. Isn't it? And when you are healed, what do you do? Do you stay in hospital? And so they come, they receive, they go. That's how some people see church. That's how they see prophets or ministers. They see them as doctors. And when you are finished with a doctor, do you go to his house? He goes his way. That's how they relate to God. Some people see church as ATM point. You know those ATM galleries? You have a lot of them in Lagos. You go there to do what? To cash. And after you have cashed, what do you do? You go home. So they see the church as a means to make things, to buy, to for, let my life be better, let me have money, let things work out. And so 
after that they don't have anything to do with the church again even if they are inside church they are not in the church so it's not wrong to go to the lord because you need it is biblical to seek for a miracle it is right to say god you must do this but you must follow him for reasons bigger than that if you are with me say i hear you sir the fourth group of people that follow jesus are what i call the young converts the nicodemus the people that are just coming to him that are coming to his knowledge thank god that in this group of people people can move on from this group to an higher level of group if you check the bible the bible talk about milk drinkers Bible talk about meat eaters but talk about bone crushers first peter chapter 2 verse 2 let's read some scriptures first peter chapter 2 verse 2 now if you are in this group beautiful but you must not remain there first peter chapter 2 verse 2 as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that's what we are doing in this conference this is word feast i want to thank god once again for the first square gospel church i have said it repeatedly and i meant it the first square gospel church is the most balanced church that i've seen balanced i'm an apostle of balance that's one of the passion god gave to me i love things being balanced and to prove that first square believes in balance look at the logo is a square yes or no now if you throw a square and roll it on the ground it is going is it going to fall as you keep rolling what is happening it will keep standing because it is a square. Thank God for this commission. Put your hands together for Jesus. That's why a church can live three days to say, let's sit down at the word and feast with God's word. That's why I'm trying to control myself, not to turn it to a crusade. Release it as the teaching meeting. You are a baby. You come to the Lord as a baby. But you don't remain a baby. He said pure meek. Sincere meek. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. So we come drinking milk. That's the first thing. I fed you with milk. Paul said it. Not solid food. There are so many people in the church. They are meek drinkers. They don't want solid food. Some of you, when you were young, you give mommy problem. When mommy wanted to start translating to Amala, you didn't want. You still want to be talking. To... <laughs> you gave that woman problem. You didn't want to change. Women, am I talking? The baby does not want to eat to solid food. And when some of you finally turn to solid food, what is the solid food? Indomie. That's the solid food. He said, I fed you with meat and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. Even now, you are still unable to receive it. Is that your condition? Baby Christian. When did you go join Four Square? 25 years ago. And so what? People joined 10 years ago. They are passed over you. Shame on you. Oh, Lord duty. When did I become a Christian? I got born again 30 years ago. Uh -huh. mm. 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 It's not by age, you. I have seen 25-year-old boys more mature than 40-year-old men. 25. Solid. And let me tell you, in the Christian race, overtaking is allowed. If you don't grow, you keep drinking milk. The hard truth, you don't want it. There are so many Christians today, they only like the funny side of Christianity, the sweet side. When a pastor preach and they jump, they like it. When he start to tell them the hard truth, they don't like that man. Say, I don't like him. I don't like his teaching. I don't like his ministry. Because they don't want to eat the meat now. They just want the milk. They find, find the sweet, sweet, the celebration and jumping and eating and, and just something so soft. But the Bible is complete. The word of God is complete. He said about meat. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 to 13. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Did you see? 
you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles. Tell your neighbor, ha ah, ah, ha ah. They are still telling you, sister, you didn't come to church. You. Tell your neighbor, say you. They are still begging you to come to church. You. Ah, so we ha. Hmm. You. The first principles of the faith, the basic teachings of the faith, they are still telling you to pay offering. Tell yourself, say, ah, sister, you. The basic principle. Tell him, brother, it won't struggle well, you tight. Ah, ah, you tight. At this level, you are still fighting tight. You. The basic principles of the word of God. And you have not come to need meek and not solid food. I want to encourage you, please move from being a baby Christian. Stop eating solid food. Start crushing bones. That is what God wants you to be. Not somebody that's a baby for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. You are still being fed. There must come a time when, when they are looking. How can they, at the end of this year, the church is looking for leaders. And they are saying, okay, who are the people that will be leaders for next year? And they can't consider you. You are ashamed. Move! Be mature! Grow! Love the Lord. Love the world. Serve him. Be more dedicated. Move from the group of young converts and become a mature Christian. Number five. The fifth group of people that follow Jesus in his days were people I call conditional servants and conditional followers. Conditional servants, conditional followers. You can call them fair weather Christians. John chapter 6, you will see them there from verse 66. These are people that followed him because of situation and circumstances. And you still find them in the church. Conditional Christians. They serve the Lord if and when it is convenient. They follow the Lord because of this. John chapter 6, please. Verse 66. Let's read it together. And I'm asking, is this your good? Jesus one day started to preach the hard truth. If you read from the beginning... He has been feeding them milk before, but he started telling them some hard things. One of the things he told them is that until you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you cannot be my disciple. They say, ha, 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 You know, some people say that. I don't want to do it again. Ah, this is getting too much now. What's the meaning of all this? He told them. He was telling them some hard truth. And as I used to tell people, you have to drink his blood and eat his flesh. You must understand that. In the realm of the spirit, Christians are flesh eaters. We are blood drinkers. How many blood drinkers are here? You are not a blood drinker. You think the Jew doesn't know what he's doing when he has to stay at home every first Sunday. What do we do every first Sunday? I can't hear you. For the old Jew staying home every first Sunday to serve your Holy Communion. Please, what are you drinking during Holy Communion? <laughs> you are a blood drinker. That unliving bread they gave you, what do we call it? I can't hear you. I'm your old boy. So who are you? I can't hear you now. <laughs> and I want to tell you another one. Not only are you a flesh eater and a blood drinker. Uleye. You know when you robust say somebody leye? You know the meaning? You go bored. How many of you leye here? You have you have a ye? You don't have. Oh, what is this? And you want to walk the story pulpit, ah, four square, and lay yeah, four square, and lay yeah, and took that yeah, and yeah, and yeah. Is this not a yeah? Ah, a yeah, fun fun. You put it here on the pulpit. So you are a blood drinker, a flesh eater. What do you want to get in? Ah. Clap if you want to clap. 
So when somebody outside there in Yaba or anywhere tells you stories, say, ah, Emimege, say it somewhere. <laughs> Let something happen. Say, don't be, ah, ah, ele ye enemy. The man will say, ah, ele ye ya, ah, mo. He will just leave you alone. Because he will not know the meaning of ele ye. And are you not ele ye? If you're a blood drinker here, rise on your feet. If you're a flesh eater here, rise on your feet. If you have the board of the Holy Ghost, rise on your feet. Can I hear you shout, yeah? That's who you are. And be proud of it. If witches are telling people I drink blood, go on the street of Yab and tell them I'm also a blood drinker. Let them find out before you tell them the meaning. Can you see one bear? one major. I'm sure I am a major. One year, sorry, your daddy, I'm out. He did not come to you now explain to them the blood. <laughs> but blood, no, no. And that blood is better than any blood. In fact, if anybody is saying I drink blood, we are the one that should say it. Because we are drinking the purest of all bloods. The greatest of all bloods. The most powerful of all bloods. Are you proud to be a blood sucker? Yes! I'm proud to be a blood drinker. The blood of Jesus. That was cruised on the cross of Calvary. I'm a flesh eater. The flesh of my Lord Jesus. And I have the Holy Ghost. The purest of all ports. Living inside of me. Steering my life. Taking me from one realm to higher realm. Can I have a shout in this house? Be seated. So John chapter 6. Verse 66. Conditional followers. John chapter 6. Verse 66. Look at it. Let's read. John chapter 6, verse 66. Please help us. From that time, many of his disciples went back. Did not walk no more with him. Did you see? Why? Next one. Because I want to talk about that verse 66 now. Uh -uh. John 6, 66. You've jumped to... From that time, Mary of went back and walked no more with him. In the next verse, 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? The next verse. And Simon Peter said, You know, Simon is the one that we always talk. <laughs> you know, when I got to heaven, when Pastor was saying, Pastor said, You know, he used to have a lot of questions, they have been answered. Me, many of my questions is not answered. I was thinking it's along my thought. I didn't know your thought is not my thought. Say, when I was a young Christian, I asked a lot of questions that, that have been answered. Me, my questions are not answered. Even that the GO cannot answer them. There's only one place I will get answer. Heaven. That's why we get there. Some of us are preparing for heaven already. Because I, I have questions and I must have those questions answered. If I tell you some of them, you will laugh. But they are true. One of the things I want to do when I get to heaven. Tabashi convocation ton. Shanka koma she party convocation. Pa war no. Reception. I bear money. See the Bible, I'm actually reception. Oh my kira wa hip. You will not speak your ruba then. I don't even know the language you'll be speaking. It's a strange one. But all of us will understand. We don't speak. After we finish, one of the first houses I want to visit is the house of Brother Peter. I will just call him if there's intercom. There will, there will no even intercom. I'll just say, Peter, I want to see you. I'll say, yes, I'm hearing you. That's how it will be in heaven. I guess. <laughs> and then I say, bro, Peter, I want to go. Because it will be bro. And then Peter will say, come over. You will not call my name. Now, that's not the name. You will not call me Samuel 1 because my name is not Samuel 1. That one is earthly name. Have you seen the Bible? The Bible says all of us have a name. That's part of the reason I want to go to heaven. The Bible says all of us have a name. It is written under a white stone. He said, it's only those who get to heaven that will open it and see their name. So until you get to heaven, you are nameless. Did you hear me? You are nameless. And in Yoruba land, if you give back to a child, there is some Oluruko. Korili Ayewa. So if you get to heaven, and you, didn't, you, did, you leave this earth without the heavenly name, and the only way you can have a name is to get to heaven. You know the reason why men, some of us, I want to get to heaven. How many of you want to follow me to heaven? I will get to heaven. And I pray for you. You will not miss heaven. We will not miss heaven. 
we will make heaven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask Simon Peter. I have a lot of questions I want to ask him. I want to ask him. I want to greet him, brother David. I'll go to David and say, Ah, bro. After I go to Solomon, say Solomon, Solomon. Ah, bros, bros. Bro, can you please answer me? 300 wives and 700 concubines. Me, I have question that nobody can. Okay, can Daddy Gio answer that question? So who will answer it? So where must I get to to get the answer? And if you want the answer, follow me there. Not now. You are not going now. Tell your neighbor, you are not going now. You are not going now. You will finish your race. Because heaven is going nowhere. So we don't have to be in a hurry. I pray for you, you will not die before your time. You will not die before your time. You will clock your 80s. Live to your 90s. You will finish the full circle of life. You will see your children's children. You will fulfill your mission. Like Paul, you will say, now I can go home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So these people followed him. And Peter said, John chapter 6, verse 66, back there. Say, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of life. Some people went back. The twelve were not the only disciples, so they were more than twelve. But only the twelve remain. And that brings me to number twelve. Number six, the backsliders. They follow Jesus too. They follow Jesus. The once upon a time Christians. I remember those days when we were on campus. My friend, shut your mouth. Campus was 40 years ago. You are still talking about when you were on campus. Campus was 10 years ago. My friend, where are you now? I remember those days. I will go behind the chapel. We will pray. I don't hear. So what are you doing today? Once upon a time, Christians, we used to. That will not be your testimony. And there are two types of backsliders. There are backsliders who are still in the church. And there are backsliders who have gone out into the world. Some people backslide, they go into the world. Some people backslide, they stay in the church. If you are here and you are a backslider, the Lord will restore you. The power of God will bring you back. In the name of Jesus. And no matter your reason, don't backslide. People backslide for different reasons. Yesterday I told you about offense. Some people backslide because of offense. God did this for me. I will not serve him again. God did not do this. I will not serve him again. And God did not answer me. And God, I will not serve him again. Forget. I remember when I was in school. There was a particular semester. I did some exams. And I was a very committed student leader when I was in school. So, I knew I did not read very well. I knew it. You know that kind of exam you do, you know you did not deserve it. I knew I did not read. So instead of me to be humble enough, which I learned to do later, I say, God, I can't fail. If I fail, you'll be put to shame. If I fail, Father, you'll be put to shame. And your name must not be disgraced. You know the good news. Help me. And God was not put to shame. In fact, God was more glorified. I now became humble. <laughs> no one said, eh? God, if you don't do this, my friend, I'm sorry to say, if you don't want to go, get out. Go on, backslide. Talon beg. Backslide. Go on, backslide. Backslide. Go on, backslide. Who will lose? It is you that will lose. God can lose nothing. The church cannot lose. Because if you are not there, somebody else will be there. So don't stop threatening God. Some people like to threaten God. Father, 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 you better do this. You are talking to my father like that. Yesterday I was telling you about not referencing God. Father, Father, Father. Thank God you are not in the days of Moses. Me, so I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go
wa gbe ni wa da bi eja sawa wa gbe you're telling god who let me tell you one about god we call him kabiosi he does it without asking you if he does if he doesn't do it he's still god let your christianity get to that level you are threatening god me i used i did it when i was young from that time i never did it again never in my life i learned it very early in my christian life they are telling god that if you fail god will fail god cannot fail you will load that fail you will be on your own you will be shamed you will carry it on yourself god can never be shamed so stop threatening god are you with me if you hear me say i hear you sir but i want to encourage you please come back if you are going back please come back Listen to this. God will never let you go except you let him go. Please come back. He will never let you go. God loves you. He will never let you go. If you are here in this church tonight and you are saying, I'm weak, I'm going back. Please, tonight is your night. I'm going to give a call when I finish. Just come to the altar and start afresh. It is never too late to start afresh. If you come back, you will come back. I've heard people talk about eternal salvation. Yes. There's eternal salvation. And no, there's no eternal salvation. I've had people preach the doctrine of grace in an extreme way. And this is my stand. Hear this and hear this well. God will never let you go, but you can let him go. God will never. The moment you give your life to Jesus, he will keep you. He will never let you go. He will keep dragging you. He will keep dragging you. In fact, God is here. He never moves. You are the one that is moving back. And you are 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 moving. And he will keep pulling you. Are you moving back? And you are moving back. A German will make him more Java. Where are the protocols? Hey, she died. Come and stand there. You want Bishop to fall? Ah, and you are moving back. God will say, hey, Omo, hey, my son, please now. Please now. <laughs> and then you keep going God say, hey, hey. get to the extreme of sin is still going to be with you I'm pulling you back the only day is when you let go when you let go God says well, you're on your own God doesn't move you are the one moving so what is God come back God doesn't go you are the one that went away God you don't say God come back is an insult. Where is he coming back to? The Bible says the heart cannot even contain him. His leg has filled the whole heart. So where is God going? The heaven cannot contain him. You are the one going away now. So come back. Tell your neighbor, come back. So as long as you stay with him, he will keep you. But if you leave him, if you let go, look at Saul, look at David. Saul let go. David did not let go. Saul sinned. David sinned. Saul committed errors. David committed errors. Saul did not come back to God. David never left God. He comes back and says, Lord, you God will help me. And God pulled him back. So that's where eternal salvation comes. If you keep your salvation, because you can lose it, but if you keep your salvation and keep loving him and keep trusting him, if you fall, you stand up, you ask for grace, and you keep walking according to his will, you are saved and your eternity is guaranteed. But if you are careless and you think, I'm saved, let me leave me alone, I'm saved. It's like that time when I was coming. Did you see that even me, I was wise? When I got here, what did I do? But if you think, ah, there's nothing, there's nothing. Why shubu? You will fall. And you may fall without repair. You will not fall. And that brings me to the seventh group. And on that we have gathered for these days. The disciples. The true disciples. Mark chapter 3 verse 14. Mark chapter 3 verse 14. Get ready for the next few minutes as I wrap everything up. Then they appointed 12. That they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. Only true disciples can truly follow. This is the group we are inviting everybody to join. Not the multitude and the spectators. 
Not the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sahendrins. Not the group of the needy and miracle seekers only. Not the group of the young converts. Not the group of conditional followers, servants. Not the group of the backsliders. But the group of true disciples. Matthew chapter 8 verse 23. Matthew chapter 8 verse 23. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Only true disciples will follow. His disciples followed him. Look at what the Bible says also in Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? And follow me. I will show you the depth of that mystery as we round up on Sunday for just a few minutes. You must be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be a disciple, you must be born again. John 3, 1 to 7, you must be born again. Number two, to be a disciple, you must have the yoke of God on you. Number one, to be a disciple, you must be born again. John 3, 1 to 7. Number two, to be a disciple, you must have the yoke of God on him. Matthew eleven twenty nine to 30. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke. So, there is a yoke of discipleship. You need to carry that yoke. Yoke, not in terms of trouble and burden, because that's the nature of yoke, but yoke in terms of, you know, accepting that this is your final bus stop. That's a disciple. Yoke in terms of you have totally submitted. That's the meaning of take my yoke upon you. It's not taking burden. Jesus doesn't have any stress. Yoke in terms of willingness and, and willingness to follow him, even, even when it's convenient or not. You, you follow whether you are willing or you are not willing. Let me tell you this. There, is, there, is, there are times you have to do mechanical Christianity. Only disciples can do mechanical Christianity. You say, Samuel 1, ask me. Say, Samuel 1, what do you mean? Ask me now. Ask me again. Ask me one more time. I will tell you what I mean by mechanical Christianity. It is not every time you feel like praying. Oh, see angels. They did not talk. There are times you don't feel like praying. It's all time that you feel like reading the Bible. Even some of us pastors, it's not every time you feel like going to church. But there are things you do because you have to do it. That's mechanical Christianity. And it's only disciples that do that. I remember the days when we got born again. Those of you that got born again in the 70s and the early 80s, you understand this song. Bina banjo. Bina banjo. Bina Bojo wrong hotel. Aha. It's an old school song. It's not a modern song again. Tidodla 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 Banro. Emio tell it Jesu. No bank me miracle. Emio tell it Jesu. Tibo where Banro Sumo ton don ton jola one. Amy o tele Jesu, my darling ho. That's modern Christianity. But a true disciple take the yoke. There are things you do, not because you don't give, you don't. I told you yesterday, give willingly, yes. But sometimes you you start, you force yourself. For example, look at seed, giving seed. Giving seed. Giving sacrifice, say Lord, I want to contribute. It's not easy. For example, look at Nigeria today. They say, hey, everybody in church, go and bring 50, 50,000 naira. You do calculation. Yes or no? Ah, let me If daddy wants to do, mommy, I know you say, I know you say, I know you say, you better be careful. Don't tell me, don't get up and tell me, Holy Spirit spoke to you. <laughs> But there are some things we just do. You do it. With, that's what the Bible says. They that sow in tears. That means it's mechanical. And when you are happy, do you cry? So there are things you do in tears. You don't like it, but you have to do it. That's a disciple. Because it's normal. It's proper. It's the right thing to do. Are you still with me? 
Number three, disciples are the one is a is that one that serves only one master totally. Matthew six twenty four. If you're a disciple, you serve only one master. Stop all these uh, three gods, four gods, Christianity you are doing. Serve this one, serve this one. Don't do that. There's only one Jesus and he's the way to life. Only one God. I thank God for the, for, for the vision of first square. Only one. He's only one. We have a lot of people today preaching. One day I was listening on, on uh, I was watching on uh, YouTube. And one of the most respected ministers in the world that thing is is makes me sad one of the most respected preachers in the world having one of the biggest churches in the world in america was being asked by a very popular woman on a on a show about five years ago say very direct question is jesus the only way and the man said it depends on the way you look at it i won't tell you the name i'm sure daddy knows what i'm talking about I don't want to tell you because I don't want to look like a critic here. I was disappointed. I was, I say, ah. Me, I have the opportunity. I would, mad, I'm about them, mad, be bullying. Oprah Winfrey asked to be on that show is a platform for evangelism. You now want to be politically correct. Some of us cannot be popular because we are too we are too heavily correct to be politically correct. Clap if you want to clap. I don't want to be politically correct. And I don't want to be socially correct. I want to be scripturally correct. Is Jesus the only way? Say it depends on the way you look at it. My friend! Let me start to round off. I need to close now. You need to be a disciple. Number four. He whose mind is made up to follow Christ alone till the end. John chapter 6, 68 to 69. That's disciple. Somebody that said, I will follow him till the end. That's disciple. Job 13, 15. Follow Christ till the end, no matter what happened. That is the person that is a disciple. Job said, though he slay me, I will serve him. Number five, who is a disciple? One who lives a life of conformity to the image of Christ. I'm just running off. In five minutes, I show you I'm running off. One who lives his life in conformity to the image of Christ. Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. Number six, who is a disciple? One that endures persecution for the sake of the gospel. One that endures persecution for the sake of the gospel. Acts 5.40-41. Acts 5.40-41. 2 Corinthians 4.17. This is a word feast. So you should write down scriptures. Second Corinthians 4, 17, Acts 5, 42, 41. Then Acts chapter, Acts chapter 20, 22 to 24. Acts chapter 20, 22 to 24. Number seven and the last one. Who is a disciple? He who looks beyond the temporal today to the eternal tomorrow. Who is looking to eternity? You are thinking of eternity. You are not thinking of this world, this uh, ephemeral world that we go even if you have all the riches of the world by the time you you are 80 year old your body will be telling you oh mama lolly 80 83 85 90 your body will be telling you 91 in fact if you stay too long your children will be praying for you to go and rest i'm telling you one day family came to me some years ago i knew the son i met the, the, the daughter outside the country so they now call me and say, hey, their father, their father happened to be a Muslim. Their father is a very powerful man. They said, they said, I should pray. What was the prayer? I didn't even know the story. It was that I knew the story. They said, we should pray that their father should die. I said, who, ma who made me a minister of death? You're asking me to be praying for your father to die. What kind of prayer is that one? But when I heard the story, I knew. The first time the Baba died, you know, Muslim bury every day immediately. As they put him there, call everybody to bury him by four o'clock. When it's around 3.30, the man said, Listen! He woke up. <laughs> Those on their way from the Ekpadao, <laughs> Baba Tijio, Baba Wologi, Baba Woleni, Baba Yinani. So they went back. So all the food they have put, they used to do Sarah. They said, We thank God. Ojo Babo Tony. So Baba died the second time. And this time around, 
they waited for the second day before to bury Baba. And they done the metra test, they have done everything, Baba is dead. Well, you know, he's always in the house. So they put him in the house. So they said, okay, we're coming. They have prepared food, prepared everything. Everywhere was set. People were ready to eat. The things was wanting to rush or Mugan because an old man. 45 minutes. <laughs> Abba woke up again. <laughs> One of them said, when your father died, when he died, when he really died, if I was one of them say, who will bury him? No, he will call me. So, Baba is now sick. They don't even know how to take care of him. They said, let us pray that he will go. Let me call him, he's a minister of death. I know of a story of another woman. People have evil power. This story of this Baba, they discovered that when, so I took up the prayer. Let me tell you the end of the story. So we started to pray spiritually because many of the Christians have become Christians. They discover on the toe of Baba there is a ring. They have been there for long. The skin has covered the ring. Ah, there is evil power. But the power of Jesus is above them all. I don't want to stand to that story. Rise up on your feet. I don't want to go into that. My time is over. Now listen to this. For you to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to follow him. The word discipleship is from the word disciple and sheep. A sheep is what you all get inside and you are going on the road. So discipleship and to be a true disciple is a process. It's not a journey of one day. It's a continuous thing. You must follow him every week. You must follow him every day. You must follow him every season of your life. This was the mentality those of us that got born again in the 70s and the early 80s had. I got born again the years of the SU. When, when you get born again, you know you are born again. They call us SU then. You have to be a fanatic. They don't call anybody fanatics today. Because we are no more fanatical. We handle our faith like this. You're not serious. But when you get born again, your family know you are born again. Your friends know you are born again. Your neighbors, everybody know you can't hide it. It was not very common to be born again. So those who got born again, really got born again. You are not up and down. You are serious. You are committed. You are dedicated. Your mind is made up. This is what this commission is calling every one of us to in this program. Follow him dogmatically. You know the reason why Islam is spreading all over the world? And we have a serious battle in our hands. The church is breeding Christians who are too materialistic conscious. Whereas Islam is building fanatics. That's the truth. How many fanatics do we have in the church? I want you to use the word fanatics correctly, not negatively. The word fanatics. The word fanatics actually means to be dogged about something. To believe in it totally. From a positive angle. How many fanatics do we have in the church today? How many true disciples? When a young man put bomb on himself and, and bomb himself, do you think that young man is thinking of job? Is he thinking of wife? Is he thinking of the next corolla? Is he thinking of buying a car? Those are the people Islam is breeding. They can die for their cause. How many Christians are ready to do that? We just want to live a comfortable life and enjoy a life and go. No, 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 no. You are not going to face it in Jesus' name. But have to make up your mind.